Richard Nixon were in Congress now, that he'd be caucusing with a half a dozen people on the far left. That's not a joke, incidentally. Uh, well, while wealth and power have uh, narrowly concentrated uh, uh, for most people in the country, the real incomes have stagnated, and they've been getting by with uh, increased work hours by now far higher than Europe, even Japan, uh, debt, which can only go on for so long, and uh, asset inflation, like uh, the the bubble, the housing bubble is the most recent case. And these uh, bubbles are repeatedly destroyed by the financial crisis, crises that began to occur uh, in the Reagan years uh, as the regulatory apparatus uh, was dismantled. Uh, the effect is that the country is being severely weakened. Well, none of this is problematic for the very wealthy, in particular for the financial institutions. By now, their share of corporate profit rose to an astonishing 40 percent in 2007, right before the crash that they caused. And the major players benefit from a government insurance policy, which is called too big to fail. And as one commentator quipped, too big to jail. And they can get away with any crimes they like. Uh, they can. Uh, 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 the result is that with the government insurance policy, they can make uh, and do make very risky transactions, uh, which mean rich rewards, uh, uh, while adhering to a, st a basic market principle uh, that you ignore externalities. In a market system, you make a transaction, you ignore the effect on others. What? economists call externalities. In this case, the externality is systemic risk, the risk that if one of your transactions goes back bad, the whole system may collapse. Well, the system inevitably crashes. It's happened over and over again since the Reagan years, each time more serious than the last. But that's not a problem, because they can run to the nanny state that they nurture and ask for a taxpayer bailout, and meanwhile they clutch their copies of uh, Hayek and Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand in their hands. Uh, and that's been the regular process since the Reagan years. Uh, uh, for, uh, it's uh, each crisis more extreme than the last, uh, for the public that is. Uh, right now, the real unemployment is at the levels of the Great Depression for much of the population. But the main architects of the crisis are bigger and richer than before. Uh, that's what happens when you control the state. Uh, Goldman Sachs, for example, the biggest criminal, uh, they've just quietly announced uh, $17.5 billion in compensation for last year for executives with the CEO, Lloyd Blankfein, receiving a $12.5 million bonus, and his base salary was tripled uh, in appreciation for having crashed the economy. And much the same is true among, his, um, among its colleagues. England is pretty much the same. Well, these developments contribute to American decline but not as often argued to the shift of global, global uh, power to China and India. The world's becoming more diverse, but despite their rapid economic progress, these two great uh, Asian powers are hardly poised to assume uh, a dominant role in the world. Uh, one illustration, you can look it up on the internet, uh, is uh, the, United, the United Nations Human Development Index. It kind of measures the health of the society. Uh, China now ranks 89th, They're right next to the Dominican Republic and El Salvador, two pretty poor countries. Uh, India ranks 115th. It's next to Cape Verde and Timor-Leste extremely poor countries. Uh, each of these two Asian giants also suffers from extreme inequality, about the same as the US. Uh, that means that the large majority of the population ranks even lower. The CIA estimates that China's uh, 
gross domestic product per capita at about 20% of that of the rich countries, Europe, for example. Uh, furthermore, they both have huge internal problems, uh, ecological and human. Uh, India is torn apart by major internal wars, uh, China by severe repression, and very wide labor unrest, uh, tens of thousands of labor actions every year, according to official figures. Reality is probably greater. Uh, China is also facing a severe demographic problem. It did have spectacular recent growth, but that relied very heavily on the availability of a young and productive labor force. That's a non-repeatable historical phenomenon. A China scholar uh, Wang Feng observes that favorable democratic, uh, demographic def dividend is expected very soon to disappear, and in fact to reverse sharply with significant effects on labor productivity and also on social life, uh, in particular ability to care for the growing elderly population. The social system that formerly existed has collapsed. Uh, also, there's an effect on the, of the sex selection. There's a illegal, but there's a very definite sex selection policy. Uh, it has led to a vast excess of males over females uh, in the population under 20. And that could have extremely severe social effects. Uh, China is indeed a huge manufacturing center, but it's not like Germany. Uh, China is basically an assembly plant. It's an assembly plant for the advanced industrial societies surrounding it, Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan. They provide the parts and the components and the advanced technology, as incidentally does the United States and other rich countries of the West. Uh, everyone talks about the U.S. trade deficit with China. But when it's properly calculated, as has been done by a couple of economists, uh, namely estimated in terms of value added, how much is produced, literally produced in each country, well, it turns out that the deficit with China declines by about 25 percent, and the deficit with its Asian suppliers increases by about 25 percent. Uh, so this is not the kind of export economy that Germany is, quite different. Uh, sooner or later, uh, China will presumably climb the technology ladder, but it's not going to be an easy path. There is, in fact, a very noticeable and significant global shift of power, but a different one. Not from the West to the Asian giants, but from the global workforce all around the world to the very rich. That's happening everywhere. Uh, the tendency is implicit in what are called free trade agreements, which have little to do with free trade and certainly aren't agreements, at least if people are part of their countries. They're mostly opposed. Uh, but what are called free trade agreements, uh, uh, with, um, uh, they're designed to set working people in competition with one another globally while protecting wealthy professionals and providing investors with extraordinary rights. Among other benefits for investors, these agreements allow free movement of capital, but they firmly reject Adam Smith's principle that free circulation of labor is a foundation of free trade. And in many other ways, too, they violate basic free trade principles. And uh, these tendencies are exacerbated in very ugly ways by growing xenophobia in the rich societies, notably in Europe. The picture that's developing is very aptly described in a brochure for investors that was produced recently by Citigroup. It's a huge bank that once again is feeding at the public trough, as it has done regularly for 30 years, in the course of a cycle of uh, risky loans, uh, huge profits, and bailout when it crashes. Uh, the, and like Goldman Sachs, they've gained from the crisis that they helped create. The bank's analysts in this brochure, they describe a world that's dividing into two blocks, the one block they call the plutonomy. Uh, 
that's the very rich globally. And they're the ones who power the growth, and they're the ones who largely consume the growth. Then there are the non-rich, the majority. Now those are now sometimes called the global precariat. Precariat is a workforce, a proletariat, living in a precarious existence. That's increasing status of the global workforce. Uh, in the United States, the precariat is uh, subject to uh, global working insecu worker insecurity. That's Alan Greenspan's words when he was testifying to Congress about the success of the economy he was managing. He said it's based on growing worker insecurity, which is the basis for a healthy economy. Any economist can explain if workers are insecure, they don't ask for rights, they don't ask for wages, they don't make any protests, uh, you can harshly exploit them. Uh, the Citigroup analysts advise investors to focus on the very rich, where the action is. They have what they call a plutonomy stock basket, you know, investment advice aimed at the very rich. And they point out that that plutonomy stock basket has greatly outperformed the world index of developed markets since 1985. That's when Reagan-Thatcher economic programs of uh, enriching the very wealthy were really taking off. Well, that, that's a shift of power and a very significant one. I've barely skimmed the surface of these critical issues, enough, I hope, to suggest things you can think about. But I don't want to end without mentioning another externality that's dismissed in market systems. That's the fate of the species. Uh, if you're a corporate executive, your task is to maximize short-term profit and uh, uh, market share. That's, in fact, what your salary is based on. Uh, if that happens to endanger the species, that's an externality. You don't pay, pay for it. You don't take account of it in a market system. Uh, in the financial system, systemic risk, main externality, that can be remedied by the taxpayer. But nobody's going to, going to come to the rescue if the environment is destroyed. And that it must be destroyed comes pretty close to being an institutional imperative. So U.S. business leaders, U.S. is the most business-run society in the world, so significant in this respect. U.S. business leaders are quite openly conducting energetic propaganda campaigns to convince the population that uh, anthropogenic global warming, human contribution to global warming, is just a hoax. Uh, and uh, they're having some success. By now, probably two-thirds of the population doesn't believe it. Uh, well, uh, these same people who are running the campaigns, uh, they're just like the rest of us. Uh, they understand very well that the threat is grave. I mean, in their private lives, maybe they're contributing to, you know, the Sierra Club or something. But in their institutional lives, they have a role. Uh, they have to maximize short-term profit and market share. Uh, if they don't do it, uh, they'll be thrown out, and somebody else will come in who will do it, meaning the problem is institutional. It's not individual, hence it's much more severe. Now, this is another vicious cycle, and this one could well turn out to be lethal. If you want to get a sense of how grave the danger is, uh, simply have a look at the new Congress in the United States, which is propelled into power by business funding and propaganda. Uh, almost all of the new people in Congress are climate deniers, climate change deniers, they don't believe it. And they've already begun to cut measures that might mitigate environmental catastrophe. Uh, so, for example, they're trying to get rid of the Environmental Protection Agency introduced by Nixon, the last liberal president, and now they want to get rid of it and much else. Uh, worse still, some of them are really true believers. 
For example, the new head of a subcommittee on the environment, uh, he explained to the press that global warming cannot be a problem because God promised Noah that there wouldn't be another flood. So he takes care of that. Well, actually, uh, one shouldn't laugh. I mean, if this was happening in some small, uh, remote country, okay, then you could laugh. Uh, but not when it's happening in the richest and most powerful country in world history. And before we laugh, uh, we might also bear in mind that the current financial and economic crisis is traceable in no small measure to a fanatic faith in certain dogmas uh, such as what's called the efficient market hypothesis, and in general to what uh, Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz uh, 15 years ago called the religion, and it is a religion that markets know best. Uh, the religion made it unnecessary for economists, and in fact the Federal Reserve, the central bank, made it unnecessary for them to notice that there was an $8 trillion housing bubble. It's a lot of money. $8 trillion housing bubble, no economic fundamentals, no relation to anything that, in the economy. But they didn't have to notice it because... Uh, uh, the market knows best, efficient markets uh, devastated the economy when it burst. And that's a serious religion. And interest, incidentally, that religion has been reconstituted almost without change after the total collapse of this uh, edifice, this intellectual edifice. It's a remarkable uh, event in economic history, in fact, in intellectual history. Uh, it's useful to think about what's being done in the richest country, the richest, most powerful country in human history, and what's going on in the poorest country of South America. Uh, in the United States, uh, Congress is taking the lead, uh, in, uh, and the Obama administration is going along in undermining any hope for pre preventing catastrophe. And as I mentioned, it's driven by deeply rooted institutional factors. Uh, poorest country in South America is Bolivia. They are, have taken the lead in the world in efforts to pr protect the environment. Their most recent effort is to pass legislation granting rights to the natural world. Well, sophisticated Westerners uh, ridicule such naivete, but unless we gain some of the sensibility of the indigenous majority in Bolivia, the last laugh's going to be on us. Well, all of this and a great deal more can proceed as long as the Muasher doctrine prevails, as long as the general population is passive, uh, apathetic, uh, diverted to consumerism, uh, hatred of the vulnerable. Uh, as long as that goes on, the powerful can do what they please. Masters of the universal have their will, and those who manage to survive uh, can contemplate the ruins. Thanks. Um, I would like to quote you um, in an article on Capitalism, Europe and the World Bank about a court case that, um, that urged corporations to carry out benevolent activities or else an aroused public may figure out what corporations are up to and take away their privileges. Now, given that um, how you on different occasions quoted John Dewey, a government is the shadow cast by business over society, does court cases like Dodge versus Ford affect the behavior of politicians? Do, does what? Uh, court cases like Dodge versus court, Ford. Yeah. Um, the behavior of politicians, and if yes, uh, which methods are at the disposal of small and regional operating initiatives to make politicians aware of the existence of an aroused public sex? Mm -hmm. Well, a business can't ignore it. It's, I quote John Dewey, but I also quote Adam Smith, who said the same thing, uh, the, uh, and many others. Uh, a business can't ignore uh, what the population is doing. Actually, that's true of totalitarian states as well. So, for example, the Nazi leadership could not ignore public opinion. If you look back...
it provided benefits to the public to try to keep them quiet. Uh, and the same is true in every totalitarian state. And certainly in f more free and democratic societies, that's true. And you can see it happening. So let's go back to the Great Depression. Uh, the, there was President Roosevelt, who was unlike the current leadership, he was fairly sympathetic to social democratic measures. But at one point, he told labor leaders who were pressing for him to do various things, he basically told them, you make me do it. What he meant is get out in the streets, protest in the factories, carry out sit-down strikes, uh, organize, uh, and if there's enough public pressure, I'll do it. Uh, but I've got to face down corporate power. Well, that's basically the right advice, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, the Depre Great Depression is an interesting case. It, it began in 1929, but the, measure, the New Deal measures actually began about six years later. It took a while, and by that time there was massive public protest. Now, that was the period of great labor organizing. The CIO, the great industrial union, was being organized, and they were moving on to sit-down strikes. The sit-down strikes are extremely frightening to the masters of mankind because a sit-down strike is just one step before saying, we don't need the bosses, we'll run the place ourselves. Okay, at that point you get a major concerns. Actually, those are the concerns that uh, in the early post-war period uh, animated U.S. and British planners in places like Germany. Now, they were concerned that that was going to happen under pressure, this pressure from the East that they were worried about. It's one of the reasons they wanted to wall off Western Germany and the same elsewhere. So these are constant concerns and it runs from factories to protests in the streets. Uh, so, for example, uh, and it, it has effects. Uh, uh, during the 1960s, the next great, in the United States, the next major period of uh, sort of you know, social democratic activism on the part of the government, uh, that was clearly motivated by the uh, mostly youth at that time activism in uh, uh, the ninth, you know, which you know about the radical activism of the 60s. And in fact, the business world was very upset about it. And the liberal intellectuals were very upset about it. If you haven't read it, there's an important book to read. It's called The Crisis of Democracy, uh, published by the Trilateral Commission in the, around mid 70s. The Trilateral Commission is liberal internationalists from Europe, the United States, and Japan, three major industrial countries, uh, to give a sense of their complexion. They're, they're the people who staffed the Carter administration. And that's kind of the liberal extreme. Uh, you go over to the right, it's much harsher. So what was the crisis of democracy that they were concerned about? They were concerned that the population was demanding too much democracy. The people who are usually passive and apathetic, what they call the special interests, uh, are getting out in the streets, uh, protesting, insisting on their demands. So who are the special interests? Uh, the young, the old, uh, women, workers, uh, farmers. Uh, in fact, the population. The population are the special interests. If you notice, there's one, you read the book, you'll find there's one interest that they don't mention, uh, corporate power. And there's a reason for that, because they're the national interest, by definition. So they can never ask for too much. They're supposed to get everything. But the rest of the population, which is supposed to be obey the Muasher doctrine, supposed to be passive, apathetic, uh, diverted to something else, they were getting out and demanding things. And there were changes. And in fact, these changes ran primarily in the Nixon, in the Johnson administration, but also in the Nixon administration. He, as I mentioned, was the last liberal kind of social democratic president. Well, that's from the pressures. And that happens over and over, uh, all the time. So that's just a continuing aspect of modern history. So there's a lot that you can do. In fact, almost anything in a you know, free societies like, like ours, uh, there's very few limits. The, maybe it might be hard, you know, you might lose a job or something, but you're not gonna be tossed into a torture chamber. You know, it's not like 
the global south or totalitarian states. So sure, this, everything's open. Uh, exactly what to do depends on the circumstances and the issue. A lot of it's going on right now in, in say, Spain. Uh, with uh, very significant protests underway. It went on in the United States uh, in the industrial heartland, uh, Wisconsin, uh, right at the same time as the Arab Spring, uh, also very significant. If that reaches enough of a scale, uh, the people who run the place have to pay attention. In fact, if you read the business literature uh, after the 1930s New Deal measures, uh, they were terrified. Uh, the business literature talks about uh, the hazard-facing industrialists in the rising political power of the masses. I'm quoting, uh, the need to fight the everlasting battle for the mind of men to indoctrinate people with a capitalist story or else we'll be in trouble. You know, if this sounds like a little red book, uh, it's, it's because it is. Uh, the business classes are vulgar Marxists. And what, they're always fighting a bitter class war, and uh, that values happen to be inverted, but it's just what you read in um, you know, malice tracts or something like that. So they understand, constantly at it, and if the population gets out of control, then you have to, you have to do things. Uh, plenty of examples. In fact, modern history is full of them. That's why we have more freedom uh, and more rights and so on. It's not given as gifts from above. As I understood you, it's upon us as citizens to change the system. Uh, do you think the democracy as we have it at the moment is enough for that or do we need forms of direct democracy or new forms of democracy? I mean, in, in principle, we've got institutions that could work, but you have to make them work. It's like Roosevelt said, make me do it. Uh, and uh, there are big barriers to democracy. So, for example, there's a fundamental contra contradiction between capitalism and democracy. You can't overcome that contradiction. Uh, so it's... Uh, uh, you know, the capitalist system has changed over the years, but it's still divided between people who give orders and people who take them. Uh, and as long as that goes on, well, that's a, plainly a barrier to democracy. Uh, if the masters of mankind, Adam Smith's phrase, if they get too much power, then the barrier is very high. Uh, if they can be controlled, uh, then the barrier goes down. Incidentally, to quote John Dewey again, that John Dewey was not a particular radical. He was the leading social philosopher in the United States in the late 20th century, 20th century throughout. Uh, his position was not only that, what well, you quoted, that uh, 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 d democracy is the shadow c cast by business over society. He also went on, he said, this, he went on to say that this isn't going to change until you have democracy everywhere, meaning industrial democracy in the workplace worker control of production and popular control of every other institution. As long as you don't have that, uh, uh, policy will remain the shadow ca cast by concentrated power over society. So yeah, there should be, if you really want functioning democracy, it's got to go to institutional changes, significant ones. Here vorne, and then, I have seen danach gesehen. First here vorne, see, and then see hinten. Hello, my name is uh, Ulios from radio station Funkhaus Europa. Dear Mr. Chomsky, I have two questions. You were speaking about the Arab Spring. Uh, how do you analyze the uprisings now of masses of people in Spain and especially now in Greece going on the streets, rejecting the party system and uh, demanding direct democracy? And uh, you were referring to the nuclear ambitions of Iran. How can you do that without uh, mentioning the uh, slaughtering of people in Iran from the regime there? Uh, people who are struggling for freedom in the last years. In Iran. And for democracy. In Iran? In Iran, yes. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, Spain and Greece. Um, quite, important things are ha quite important things are happening in Iran and Greece, but they're different. 
uh, you got to look at these things in their particular circumstances. So uh, in Greece, there's massive public protest against the austerity programs that are being imposed by the central authorities. And those are very destructive programs. Now, I think for all of Europe, my own feeling, I think what you need at a time of recession is not austerity, you need stimulus. In this case, I tend to agree with the Obama administration, though they do much too little of it. But in Greece, it's harming them very badly. I mean, they have real problems. But the programs that are being rammed down their throat by the European authorities are very likely going to destroy the economy. So people are protesting. But if you look closely, they don't seem to be protesting for anything. Not much, at least. There aren't, it's hard to find any positive calls coming out. They're opposing what's happening, and they should be, but what do you do? Well, you know, there are a few options, not very many. Didn't talk about them. In Spain, uh, there's major protests, and there are programs. But if you look at the programs, uh, they are sensible, but mildly reformist. So mildly reformist, they're needed. Uh, but the, even the press points out, Spanish press, well, these are feasible. Uh, mostly they're calling for um, a political reform. You know, like a change in the you know, electoral system to allow more participation and so on. But those are things that could be instituted uh, without you know, the masters objecting much. Uh, so it's very important, and may go on, may go on beyond that, but right now it's a significant call for limited but essential reform. That's Iran and Greece, roughly. Uh, in the United States, Wisconsin, uh, which was a big uprising, uh, tens of thousands of people in the streets day after day occupying the state capitol and so on. It went well beyond, uh, and not just young people. All, they were calling for something else, namely defense of rights that are being destroyed. Uh, there's an effort by the right wing to eliminate the last limited residue of labor rights, collective bargaining. And there's a big popular uprising to protest that. Uh, you mentioned Iran. Uh, yeah, this is a very ugly regime, highly repressive. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not unusual in the region. Like Saudi Arabia is worse. Uh, nobody talks about Saudi Arabia because it's a, US, it's a Western client, so they can do whatever they like. Uh, there was an effort in Saudi Arabia to uh, join the Arab Spring, you know, have a day of rage, protests on Friday. Um, the security presence was so extreme that people were afraid to go out in the streets. Nothing happened. And there's no protest in the West. The same in Kuwait. Loyal dictators are given the right to do anything they want. Uh, disloyal ones you've got to do something about. Uh, Iran, nothing much that the West can do, so, you know, just uh, they scream about it but can't do anything. So sure, we ought to talk about it. We ought to try to help the uh, protesters and try to protect them, but uh, the means are quite limited. Uh, in contrast, the means are very great where the West has influence, substantial influence, as with the uh, um, um, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Egypt, elsewhere. So, yes, you're right, but uh, what would you suggest doing? Sie, Sie hinten. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Um, what do you, uh, please, could you explain the meaning of nation building? Of? Nation building. Nation building? Yes. It's just another fraud, you know. It's like, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, there are uh, there are real cases. So the cases that are always presented in the literature are the success in nation building in Western Europe and Japan after the Second World War. But take a close look at what was done. First of all, th these were societies that had already been functioning. 
like if you go back to the 1920s, let's say, uh, Germany was uh, considered the you know, most democratic society in the West. Uh, also the peak of Western civilization in many ways, you know, sciences, arts, and so on. Uh, major industrial power, it was all in people's heads. So to there was no real nation building in Germany. It was just allowing the local forces to act within limits. And you should, it's important to understand the limits. There's good scholarship on this. I was quoting some of it. Uh, the effort, the primary effort in Germany and the rest of Europe was to restore the traditional order and to crush the anti-fascist resistance, which was largely labor-based. So they got to be crushed. Traditional order has to be restored. Uh, that started right away as the British and American forces were uh, beginning to you know, enter Europe that started in Italy, remember, Sicily, and then up through the Italian peninsula in 1943. One of their first tasks was to restore the fascist order uh, and uh, a traditional business rule and to destroy the resistance. And the resistance was pretty significant. Uh, the Italian partisans, uh, they were holding down six Nazi divisions. And they had pretty much liberated the northern part of the country before the British and uh, Americans got there. Uh, the British and Americans had to destroy the democratic system that had been developed by uh, the left movements, left labor movements, and to restore the uh, traditional order. Uh, then, well, I won't go through the details, but subversion in Italy goes right on until at least the 1970s. It's when the record runs dry to try to prevent those forces from emerging. In Greece, it was the same. Uh, Britain tried to suppress the uh, anti-Nazi anti resistance. They weren't powerful enough to do it. They called in the United States. Uh, in 47, 48, there was a major civil war in which maybe 150,000 people or so got killed. Uh, torture, terror, or so on, essentially restoring the traditional uh, quasi-fascist order, driving out the partisan movement, the left, and so on. And it happened everywhere. Same in Japan, same in Korea. That was a post-war policy. So yes, there was a kind of nation building, but nation building in accord with grand area principles, uh, not the pleasant mythology that people are taught in school. Uh, so yeah, it can happen. But uh, um, the other places where there have been economic and social successes, it's been over the objections of the West. Uh, there's pretty good scholarship on this, incidentally. Uh, so it's, the nation building is kind of like democracy promotion. It's another term used the same way. And there's very good scholarship on it. It doesn't penetrate the intellectual community. It doesn't reach the media and so on. But it's there. If you want to look into it, uh, speaking of the United States, the, the, the very good source is the work of uh, a man named Thomas Carruthers. He's a true believer. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he was a, an official in the Reagan administration, insider, uh, working on, na on nation building, you know, democracy promotion in mostly Latin America. But he's written about it all over the world. He was uh, the head of the uh, law and democracy project of the Carnegie Endowment, you know, big prestigious institution, written several books right up to the mid a couple of year, years ago. And he points out that uh, he's a good scholar, an honest scholar. Uh, he believes in it, but he says that, uh, you, he's speaking about the United States, the same with everyone else. Uh, he said, US leaders are schizophrenic. They support democracy if and only if it accords with social and economic objectives. Uh, and he takes, say, the Reagan administration, which was full of talk of democracy promotion, and he was in it, he was working within it. He said they were sincere, but they, uh, if you look at the progress of democracy, he said, in, in the Western Hemisphere, it did occur, but it occurred in the regions where the United States had least influence. Uh, 
So if you go down to the southern cone, the southern countries of the Western Hemisphere, there was progress in democracy. And as he pointed out, Reagan tried to prevent it and support the dictatorships he couldn't manage. So there was some democracy promotion. But if you come to the regions near the United States, where U.S. influence was overwhelming. He says, essentially, no moves towards democracy. And he gives the reason that the United States was willing to tolerate only top-down forms of democracy in which traditional uh, ruling groups remain in control and remain subservient to the United States. Those are approximately his words. Well, he considers this a kind of like a pathology. So the leadership ought to be sent to, for psychoanalysis because they're schizophrenic. Now, there's a much simpler uh, explanation, plainly, but uh, that one's ideologically unacceptable. And the same is true of nation building. So for democracy is fine for the West and Eastern Europe, great. And so you hail what's called democracy. In fact, it's interesting to look at why they held it. You go back to the business press in 1990, they were very enthusiastic about uh, the, the, the separation of the Eastern European satellites from Soviet control. The reasons were uh, it would enable business leaders to undermine the, I'm quoting, the luxurious lifestyle of Western workers because there's a new labor force that's healthy, educated, blonde, and blue-eyed, they didn't say that, but that's implicit, uh, uh, that can be exploited, very brutally exploited, and that'll undercut uh, the Western labor movements. So it's terrific. Democracy in Eastern Europe is fantastic, but not democracy in you know, the countries that we want to control, like not in the Middle East, for example, because it would be a disaster. As I said, just look at public opinion. Uh, so that's nation building and democracy promotion. It's very hard to find an exception. Um, maybe there's space for one last short question because we have an invitation then to a dinner with the rector, and I think we have to. Yeah, uh, and I think it's worthwhile. Yeah. And um, um, yeah, who is who is who is here close to a, to, to a microphone? Um, no, no. Christoph, just give a microphone to somebody. You're not Christoph. Okay, it's never Christoph. Yeah. So. We have, in the German press, we have periodic reminders that the European Monetary Union is on the brink of collapse on the one hand because like our payments to Greece and Portugal and Ireland, of course, always with xenophobic undertones. Um, and on the other hand, that the um, dollar is also very volatile. I'm not sure. I'm really skeptic about what this, these uh, announcements have for a function. But do you believe that these currencies are really on the um, brink of collapse, and if that would happen, what effect would that have on the global order? I don't think that the, the euro and the dollar and the yen are not on the brink of collapse. I mean, these are very rich societies you know, with all the problems they're having. Uh, historically speaking, it's pretty rich. It's not, they're, they're suffering, but not at the style of the South. There are problems. Uh, Europe is it is rich enough to bail out the countries that are in trouble, but it's not at all clear that that's the right approach. I mean, why should Europe follow the recommendations of the central bank that say the solution to a recession is austerity? Uh, that's been tried. I mean, that's Herbert Hoover in the United States. Yeah, yeah, his position was, uh, we got a big depression, let's go to austerity. Well, you know what happened. Economy totally collapsed. And uh, there's pretty good reason to suspect that that will happen again. If the austerity is just not the right response to unemployment, uh, uh, the recession, uh, what's the right response is essentially uh, in a state capitalist system. I mean, there are more radical responses, but keeping to the institutions, uh, the right response is probably Keynes's response, which worked. 
stimulate, the, there's a shortage of demand, demand, stimulate it, and that's got to come from the government. It could lead to a, a, a deficit, a debt, and so on, but that can be overcome with growth. That's the way to overcome it. Now, furthermore, the main problem all over the Western world is not uh, de debt, it's unemployment. Unemployment is an extremely severe problem. Uh, for one thing, it's very harmful to the people, you know, so just on human grounds, the people, the families, the communities, they're suffering. Uh, but furthermore, even on just narrow economic grounds, uh, unemployment means unused resources. Now, these are, there's, there's working people who want to work. They're things that have to be done, but the system is so irrational, it can't put uh, un, uh, uh, eager, uh, needed work into the hands of eager people. Well, that's a real a social economic problem, and it's not solved by uh, increasing uh, austerity programs. If you look at the particular countries that you mentioned, they're all different. So Ireland, for example, actually had a surplus. Spain, too, had a surplus. Uh, in Ireland, the economic crisis came primarily because the government bailed out the banks. I mean, the banks destroyed the economy. Uh, they came up, they came, came to the public and say, okay, bail us out. And yeah, they did. There's another approach, and that is to say it's your problem. I mean, suppose we, anybody really believed in capitalism, nobody does. But if they did, uh, if uh, investors, let's say banks, make risky loans, a lot of profit, and then it crashes, it's the problem of the investors. It's not the problem of the community, if anybody believed in capitalism. Uh, so that's uh, another approach they could have taken. Okay, you made the investments, you made the profits. Uh, now it's your problem. Uh, you take the losses. Uh, but the masters of mankind don't take the losses. They expect the public to bail them out. That's pretty much what's happening in Spain. Uh, Greece is a somewhat different problem. Uh, but I, I don't, it doesn't, you know, I, all of these things are debatable. It's not two plus two equals four, but I think there's good reason to think that the programs that are being pursued are not well adapted to a situation of deep unemployment, unused resources, you know, human costs, and uh, deficit, which is a problem that can be overcome with growth if demand is increased. The United States is an interesting case, actually. The uh, United States kind of leads, led the way in this. But if you look closely at the United States, the deficit, which is the big problem, it's the only issue discussed in Washington, is the deficit. Practically no discussion of the fact that unemployment is at depression levels for much of the population. Uh, what's the deficit? Well, this has been well analyzed. In the United States, about half the deficit comes from uh, military spending. Military spending in the United States is out of sight. You know, it's as, about as much as the rest of the world combined. It doesn't provide security. In fact, it provides insecurity. Uh, but it's there for its own reasons, basically grand area reasons. In fact, I quoted Clinton as saying, "We have to keep." Uh, forces forward deployed in Europe and Asia in order to ensure that people do what we want. Okay, not for the American population. Uh, so that's roughly half the deficit. Uh, the other half the deficit comes from the completely dysfunctional healthcare system. Uh, the U.S. healthcare system is an international scandal. It's about twice the per capita cost of other industrial countries that has some of the worst outcomes. And the reason's not hard to discover. It's the only privatized, uh, unregulated system. And the private sector is extremely bad at providing public goods, like health. Highly inefficient, a lot of administrative costs, uh, uh, profits, uh, bureaucracy, um, all kinds of things. Uh, so sure, it's extremely expensive. Uh, drugs in the United States cost about twice as much as comparable countries. And the reason, again, is very straightforward. Uh, in the United States, and I think it's the only country in the world, at least that I know of, the government is not permitted by law 
to negotiate drug prices. They can negotiate anything else, but not drug prices. So big surprise, drug prices are out of sight. You know? This is incidentally over the objections of about 85% of the population. Uh, there are ways to deal with this, which are not utopian. In fact, if the US had the same kind of healthcare system as other industrial countries, you know, not utopian, there would be no deficit. In fact, there would actually be a surplus. But you can't touch that because that's getting to the centers of power. The financial institutions, big pharmaceutical institutions, they won't allow it to be discussed since they basically run the government. Uh, you have a huge deficit. Well, you know, you take a look at other countries, you can find ways of dealing with the deficit problem it differs from country to country. And the big problem is lack of demand and lack of jobs. And I think that's, even, you know, so uh, the system doesn't have to collapse. I mean, maybe it will if the wrong policies are followed, but it doesn't look likely. Thank you very much.